without further ado, um, I would like to present to you Ko Seng Chun. He, oh, yeah. he is the founder and executive I... director of Dignity Kitchen, and he studied, studied engineering um, and graduated in 1986. So, Ko, over to you. Okay, I graduated in 1986 in mechanical engineering and business study, one of the early batch of students. Uh, I graduated, maybe a bit of background, I decided to stay in UK to work. I work in a foundry making steel castings. I'm one of the rare Chinese foundry men in the whole of England, right? And this was during the coal miners' strike, you know? So it's quite interesting to learn about strikes and all that. It's a very rare experience. The company has capacity, no orders. So what my company they did was why don't we buy people's company, strip them down, take the orders and do ourselves. I become what they call asset stripper. I strip assets, right? I, the company is called William Cook Steel Casting. At that time it was 3 million turnover. By the time we went to asset, we acquired 30, I went to see 30 company bought it shut five, eventually become uh, William Cook PLC. And I also done some IPO. So with the money we have, we went around the world to acquire a company and it's quite a good experience for somebody very young, okay? So after that, uh, I did my master's degree because I decided those times when you are doing it is the quite sensitive time. You know, during the coal miners strike, there's a lot of issue of unemployment. So later on, I decided to go to a master's degree. You guys, I think, I don't know what education level you're in. You come to a stage where you either do your MSc or MBA or PhD. That decision is very critical. Right. If you want to be a journalist, MBA is the answer. If you want to be a specialist, you go to what I did. I, I did my master's of science in Crankfield in computer integrated manufacturing. Imagine in 1960, I don't know, in 1987 or 89, something like that. Computer integrated manufacturing is very new, right? So I did my master's there. I graduated. I came back and I went in Geneva. Eventually, I decided to go back to Singapore. And in Singapore, I work for Cooper's and Library. I work for a management consultancy firm. Uh, I came to UK. Uh, I got my bachelor degree, my master degree, and I got my wife as well. So I got my marriage cert as well. Okay. So I married. I came back, go back to Singapore, and I started working for Cooper's and Library. Eventually, I started my entrepreneurship. But uh, I don't have a lot of money, so I started a consultancy firm. Now, you guys will come to a stage. You see, my career is very similar to yours. You come to a junction, you want to further study. You come to another junction that you want to work overseas. And I come to another junction, some of you would like to go back to home. And I come to a junction where, okay, let's, let's do entrepreneurship. Let's start my own business, be my own boss. And that is a junction that you come to it. I always tell people, if you don't jump into the water, you don't know how deep that water is, right? And I started doing that. But I did something quite unique at that time. If you, some of you have been to Singapore, it's a very clinical, clean country. There's no beggars. There's no homeless people. And most of all, there's no disabled people in shopping center. And that was the start of Project Dignity, right? I decided to work many years. At that time, I, I, was, I started my own consultancy and I did something quite unique. I take China company at that time in the 90s to go to develop business in India. I take all the Indian company to develop business in China the two of the biggest player in the market. And that's where I make my money. You see, I speak English, I speak Chinese. I don't speak very good Hindi, but I still got my way around India because you don't see a Chinese boy running the whole of India. So the story behind this is always try to make yourself unique, right? I came to Singapore, England, I studied this. You don't see a Chinese boy running a British foundry, right? Same as when I go to India. If you ever go to my Facebook, you realize how I did Indian business. It's something called a wedding, right? But that's another story. One day I'll tell you about it. How I developed India and I become very successful in India, right? I make a lot of money out of the Indians because Indian people very hard to make money, you know? Seriously, very hard to make money. So I make money out of the Indians. I also make money out of the Chinese. You see, I don't do Chinese business. I take the Chinese out of water. At that time in the 90s, China is just opening up. They really want to see the world, you know? So you bring, the, you bring the fish out of water. I bring that to Australia, set up a franchise and so forth. I make the money out of that. So eventually I say enough is enough, right? I want to do something else. And I started Project Dignity. Now I'm going to do, just be patient with me. I need to get my, I need to get my slides up. It works just now. I'm not sure whether it works now. Uh, yeah, there it is. Okay, you got it. So the slide I'm going to show you is about story. It starts, it's actually cover, 
Okay, please, sir, this is very unique. I'm doing it because I don't normally want to do this, but I'm doing it because you are from Sheffield. And the story I would tell you is the whole story. If anything, you feel that you want to stop me, by all means. Hey, guys, how do I see your face? Sir? I can't see your face now. Hold on a minute. Can you see the slide? Yes, we can, Ko. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Yeah, Ko, we, we okay. can see the slides. Okay. So this is about the strategy and so forth. Okay. So the story of a social enterprise. By the way, in 1980, 1990s, social, there's nobody knows what the social enterprise. So the story goes back to how I started it, how I take a social enterprise and scale it up overseas. By the way, I'm now the biggest social enterprise in Singapore. I'm also one of the most successful ones in Singapore. The story goes, it's very tough. Then I will tell you about the starting up a business overseas abroad. I'll tell you all the challenges and I'll tell you the lessons I learned from there. So whatever it is you want to feel to stop me, please do. So this is Dignity Kitchen. Right, let me get this up and running. Okay. Dignity Kitchen is started uh, in 06. I got this idea. All this you see are people of disability, right? That is where we come in. We take them of different disability. Okay. So we train a lot of these disabled people and the business grow from strength to strength, right? So they grow from strength to strength. So you see a lot of elderly people coming in and we train. So what we do is that we expand it. It gets bigger and bigger. So you see, my business is very unique. It's a need, not a one. If you have family members who are disabled, you know, you will join, you will actually need to seek help for them. So we have a lot of elderly coming in and we conduct training program. You see, I decided to sit down and develop a program for food store management. What that is, is, you know, the street food you see in many countries or truck stop, we actually develop curriculum for them because, you see, they are also small businesses. Then ours is not just trained. We have to place them. So we get them jobs across the Singapore, mostly in simple job. And uh, most important, they must be paid well, right? And then we got a lot of awards. Over the years, we have a lot of awards, mostly in Singapore. And more and more people uh, came to see us. And by the way, we are actually very successful, financially okay business, right? So we start winning the award, then business got bigger and bigger, right? Then we moved to this place. We have been here since 2013. And you see the elderly? There are four kinds of elderly that we came in, either physical, mental, uh, sorry, uh, those uh, can walk, some on clutches, on wheelchair, and then those who are lying flat, we actually bring them out, okay? A lot of challenges. Then we start training normal people. Then over the years, we decided that we need a system. So we went to apply for uh, ISO 22000. So you're looking at the only hawk, the street food training center that's ISO registered, okay? And that's how we get. Then we do bento box delivery and business grow from there, okay? Then, let me on the, hold on a minute, on the plan. Okay, so we develop training courses and we start training. By the way, all this you see are revenue. We every year generate million dollar business. What you are seeing now is actually a revenue generating business. Then we develop a lot of new product. As an engineer, I love I love uh, engineering. So I develop a lot of engineering to actually help people with special needs, right? Now, then all these people that work for me, some of them are special. That means either they are mental. So what you see now is over 70 people people working here of which 58 of them are disabled and we have got classes like that these are all revenue so we have a lot of outreach program that we charge you a certain amount of money to come and actually interact and work with people with disability now this is mcdonald's uh, sorry uh, microsoft we are one of the few organizations social enterprise recognized by microsoft right okay this is another project i do called dignity mama the reason reason for doing this is to engage special needs students or young people to actually sell secondhand books. So all these people you see are actually sell, uh, looking after four bookstores in Singapore. Okay. So I just give you a wrap. Let's go on. So the people we work with are either hearing impaired, Down syndrome, autism. You see, what we do is we don't look at their disability. We look at, at their ability. So we have people who are epileptic fits. So we actually try to accommodate them, but whenever they are they have a fit, we let them go. You know, we got dyslexia, schizophrenia. So imagine uh, we cover the whole range of disability. 
At the same time, the youngest we ever do is 17, the oldest we have to do 87. And they come from different nationality and race. This is my mama's store. Now, I need to solve, we are actually job creator. We are also problem solver. Now, when a mother or woman who give birth to a child who is disabled, uh, there's a problem. You see, if the family will ask, the pressure is on the mother, not on the child. So the mother get a lot of stress, right? Because why we give birth on your birth, you give birth to a child with disability. So I realized we need to find a solution. So I decided to actually bring the mother and child in and sell secondhand books. So these are all my bookshop. So they sell secondhand books. Come on, you guys have books at uh, when you read, finish, you, you don't throw away. You give it to us and we sell for what, a pound, two pounds? And that's how to support the business. By the way, this business is profitable. Our motto is to educate, to engage, and to inspire. So we have things like that, right? So what it is is every day we have lunch treat, we bring elderly here for lunch, and then we engage them, right? And we get people to pay for this. Then we got things like working disabled. I get young kids like you coming in here and then basically get you to work with disabled people. Like for example, cup stacking with one with cerebral palsy. We get you to draw, you know, play games with people with disability. By the way, at the end of the day, you can't win us, especially the cup stacking. The boy who can do cup stacking is faster than he can even play your game, right? Then we have a lot of events, like hockey for the day. We will bring you in. We will bring you in and let you run the store. Now, the uncle, the band you see there are all deaf. But when I put you in, he can make coffee, he can sell coffee. You can't. You are the disabled now. So the idea is to put you in a place where you feel uncomfortable. Then we got cook, bake, and serve. The only difference is that the, the teacher listening, teaching you is deaf, right? And yet you didn't know till he teach you. So we also do soft food for elderly, right? So we innovate. Then we start doing probiotic for elderly. And we, this is something quite unique. Uh, mental patient, as I told you, there are two kinds of, there are two kinds of prison in, in life. One is the one that commits a crime and goes to a prison. There's another prison which I always felt is for mental patient. It's called the impatient. Patient who suffer from various mental illnesses. So we realized those people will be locked up for years and years and years. So we decided to go to the mental hospital, it's a mental hospital, and we created a, co a coffee place for them. And we teach them all the food that we can do. Now, this is something quite unique. A lot of family in Singapore or in Asia, and even for students, most of the time when I go to your place, you see a lot of instant noodle. By the way, you cannot survive on instant noodle every day. And especially when the poor family, they eat instant noodle. So we decided that, okay, why don't we come up with something called $1.99, which is sing dollars. It's about 60, 60 pence, you know? And we teach you how to cook and healthy food, something very simple. And that's how we did it. As of today, we incubate over 36 food stores across Singapore now. You must understand, food store, small food store is actually a small business. And more importantly, uh, it's actually very low startup costs, right? Like this muffin store, he only sell muffin. And I tell you, he did it very well. So how do we earn money over the years? We sell food, we do delivery of food, right? We do event, we organize a lot of event, corporate event. We rent out the place for function. We do train consultancy. As of uh, 2018, the financial is one point. Uh, 600,000, but 600,000 turnover, uh, pound, sorry, 600,000 pound turnover, and the profit is about 20,000, 30,000. Now, where do, the pro where do the money goes to? Whenever we organize something, the money goes to the student, go to the training. We pay them on the day allowance. Every time we invite old people at nursing home, they come for lunch, everything, we pay for those, right? So those people is where the, all the money goes to. We don't keep the money. Two years ago, five years ago, Hong Kong came to see us. They asked us to replicate this in Hong Kong, right? So this is how it looks like. Uh, the Hong Kong government give us a site. By the way, we have been invited by every, almost every Asian country in, in who actually come to do this. Why? Because we are job creator and we also solve problem. So Hong Kong government give us a site, 6,900 square feet in the middle of the most expensive area in Kaolong, Mong Kok. So imagine this is at 618 Shanghai Street. 
So we decided to build the whole thing there, another dignity kitchen. So the place has balconies, has training room, there's event room, everything, right? And I'm very blessed. The rental is very cheap and it's a long rental and we are even given free accommodation to be there, right? Actually, by the way, we are looking at India, uh, Taiwan, Indonesia. We are expanding. We're not finished yet, okay? So Ta Hong Kong now has its own team of people, right? Let me get this up. So in Hong Kong, we started in January 2019. We started registered company in February, and then we started to set up. During those days when I set up, I need to know Hong Kong. So I spent a lot of time staying in Hong Kong. Then in June, we start building the whole structure. Then in July, I do fundraising, August. So officially in November, we sold a soft launch, and we launched a Dignity Kitchen over there. Then in January, we started the whole thing. Uh, we sell, set up up the management team and so forth then the only problem here is that we started at a time when hong kong is going to the biggest riot in its history so you see this is actual scene that we are there this is outside my our office you see a lot of people posting up the riot so we face tear gas we face rock on the floor we face barricade we got armed police everywhere and imagine at night when we sleep, uh, we couldn't sleep because the tear gas don't go away. So when you're on your air con, the air, con, air condition suck the air in and we couldn't sleep. And we cry when we sleep. We have a lot of, uh, okay, there's a lot of sensitivity in Hong Kong, especially political. So this is a common scene when we were there for six months at setting up. Then after the six months finished, we got COVID-19. So since January, we face a very tough time, okay? Maybe uh, the next five minutes, I'll tell you how we solve the problem. This is something that i like to share you. you. Remember I told you, right, I work for William Cook. We go around company stripping them. So over the years, I realized I don't want to be an asset stripper. I don't want to close company. I, I close a lot of company in my lifetime. So what I want to do is I want to grow a business. So I come up with a basic formula. In order to turn a business around, you need to increase the sales. Okay, you think of way to increase the sales. Whenever your business is in trouble, think of how to increase the sales. Then you must decrease your costs. That means the operation cost, ingredient cost. I'll show you how I did it later. So more importantly is your asset. You have asset. Okay, so during those years in Hong Kong, uh, what I did was, when the COVID-19 started in December 21st in Hong Kong, it spread all out. So I realized that I need to increase my sales. And the first thing I did is something that not many people will do. I invite, I started a marketing campaign. So the first tier is to get the government to come in and be aware of what we do. Then I do the second layer. Now, you must understand, I need to, because I'm a Singapore company, I want to pitch my business to all the Singapore Malaysian, English speaking. English speaking crowd in Hong Kong, not the Cantonese one. So the biggest uh, publication in Hong Kong is the South China Morning Post. So I went there, I pitched them, can you write a story about what we do? Let me explain to you how to see newspaper to get publicity. Until today, Project Dignity is never paid for any advertisement. It's purely a publicity. Then I go for the Chinese sector by pitching to all the Chinese uh, newspaper. Then I go for the influencer, the blogger, and finally I go for the association people in the food business and interest group. So that's how I built the sales, right? And the sales is very important. I need to do food delivery. I do everything. Then I realized I need to decrease costs. So what I did is I decreased costs by looking at my recipe. I changed from, uh, just for give example, we use pandan leaf to prepare certain food. Then I realized pandan leaf is quite expensive. I changed to pandan extracts. And then we look for cheaper value items. Then we reuse, uh, I've never sacked anyone, by the way. Then we arrange with a lot of people. We also change and reduce logistic costs. Now, so what is my asset? You'll be surprised, actually. I decided that my wall, if you ever go to, the, if you go to our Facebook, you see the wall is blank. So I decided to sell the wall. So I decided to draw a mural on the wall and I get people like Deutsche Bank, uh, Bank of Shanghai Bank, Shanghai Bank, uh, Charter, Charter Bank to come and paint the wall for me, doing drawing mural, working with disabled children and they pay for it. I work a lot with Singapore. I, 
Now, one thing most people don't know, and I think is how we, is something called data mining. Okay. Over the years, I built very good database because I'm a 10 year old company. And I realized uh, if you bother to go and talk to people in your database, they will come back and support you. So for the least, for the, the, the years that I turned around, I got to increase sales, decrease costs, and realize asset. I did something quite unique. I started a wheelchair delivery. This is my wheelchair delivery, by the way. Now, I need to solve a problem, right? And you will realize Hong Kong is quite a small place. So for them uh, to find the find job for disabled people is very tough. Most of the offices are very cramped. So I decided, why don't I get these people on wheelchair to deliver food? So we briefed I, I person wheelchair, but his, his wheelchair is manual. So I need to build a wheelchair that is actually uh, mechanic uh, and uh, electric. So that's how it looks like, see? So this one sell you the, the wheelchair, uh, the wheelchair over there, and the food is stored here, and he goes and deliver. So within one kilometer, he deliver all the food. And uh, it, it actually a fantastic idea. But in this way, I create a job for people who are wheelchair bound. And for your information, they don't earn money from the delivery. They earn money from the tips they earn. They can get a lot of tips, right? So that's what we did, right? So we also did something over there during the right crisis. We actually decided that there are a lot of people who are struggling. So we actually decided to pet. We have something called uh, paid forward. You come and have your noodle, then you buy an extra noodle, and we go around to the poor area and homeless people and we distribute the food, right? And that we are doing it every day. When you go overseas, there's a lot of problem, but you must have the right mindset that say, okay, I'm going to adapt and I'm going to change. The one of the problem was language. In Singapore, we speak English and we teach English. But when you go to Hong Kong, you need to know Cantonese. And that was a challenge for us because we can't teach. And the people we want to teach are all Cantonese speaking, right? So we have to adapt. Even written Chinese, Singapore's written Chinese is Romanized Chinese. Hong Kong one is uh, Fan Xie, which is the long, long, long written Chinese, which is different. Even China Chinese is different from Hong Kong. Even Taiwanese Chinese also different. So that was a lot of issue we can't language. The cost of operation in Hong Kong is very high. Just to come give you a rough idea, I can employ a, I don't know, uh, a clerk, a character staff for something like 600, about 400 pounds, 500 pounds per month. In Hong Kong, you're adding another 20%. So Hong Kong cost is very high. Next, you must understand we are trainers and we are chefs. So if we want to go to Hong Kong, we must also find the trainers and the chef. So the biggest challenge was finding a trainer who can speak Cantonese, who can work with people with disability. By the way, working with disability is very different. Imagine you're trying to train. Training a student is very tough. Training a person with disability to try to cook is even tougher, right? So you need to find a chef who can cook, who can teach, and who is willing to work with disabled. We actually, until today, still very different. You also must understand that, that any country you go to, there's a cultural mindset, very different. For example, in Sheffield, I got Chinese noodle. I got, you may not like the Chinese noodle that we cook, right? And there's also a culture different in terms of the language, the, the, the culture, the mindset of people over there. So the culture aspect of Hong Kong and Singapore is very different. Let me give you an example. In Singapore, if you want to raise money, people will ask you, no, this, all these jobs belong to the government. The government will support you. But in Hong Kong, they don't ask the government. They come up themselves. You see, the biggest charity, the biggest support of social in Hong Kong is not the government. It's the Hong Kong Jockey Club, right? So you see that there's a kind of laissez fair affair like over in Hong Kong, beneficiary. In Hong Kong, there's minimum wage. In Singapore, there's no minimum wage. So a lot of time, the effect of trying to find a beneficiary and training them is very different. And lastly, the law. The Hong Kong legislation and Singapore legislation is very different, especially towards people with disability. There are a lot of restrictions on even working with people with disability. You must have the solution. So coming to the more or less the end now is, what lesson do I learn from the whole 
Hong Kong experience when I scale it up. Anyway, what I'm trying to tell you now is every crisis is an opportunity. Seriously. Now, I'm very fortunate. Uh, the government in Singapore is quite proactive. But given that it's a crisis now, do you know that I can get very good people working for me now? You know, because a lot of people are out of job. And the food costs and things are much cheaper now than when it is, uh, when it's, when it is in the uh, normal time. I survived Hong Kong. Let me give you the secret to why I survived the crisis. Let me explain to you. In, in the Hong Kong government announced that everybody must wear masks, compulsory. At that time, I realized I talked to the people in Hong Kong. And even without the government telling you to wear masks, every Hong Kong person rushed out to buy masks. You can imagine one piece of mask can be as well as three pounds or four pounds. So why are they such desperate? Because they went through COVID-19. They went to SARS. And during the SARS, it took two years to get out of it. So I realized that whatever is happening, you don't need the government to tell you. It's something that people know what they are doing. So I decided that I need to do something. I need to survive for the next three to four months. In Hong Kong, the rate is half a million Hong Kong dollar every month. That works out to be about 100, I don't know, 50, 60,000 pounds or something like that, right? So I need to do something. I went to borrow money. I went to borrow 2.2 million Hong Kong dollar, expecting that the next four months I need to survive. Because let me tell you something, in business, cash is king. No matter how social you are, whatever it is, if you don't have cash, suppliers will not give you money, will not give you supply. And without supply, you can't run the business. If you don't have the cash, workers will not work for you. Then that is the reality. So what I did, I realized I need to survive. I borrowed 2.2 million. I came to Singapore. At that time, Singapore government said, oh no, we don't need to wear masks unless you're sick. Then I realized this is not right. So what I did at that time, is very, in January last year, it's very hard to find masks because everybody is chasing for masks. I call a friend in Taiwan, I call a friend in India, I call a friend in uh, Indonesia. I need to buy masks. I bought 2,000 masks. At that time, it was quite expensive. 1,000 go to Hong Kong, 1,000 come to Singapore. And I tell you, my people are now together. So what happened was I went out and borrowed 300,000 Singapore dollar because my burn rate in Singapore is about 80,000 every month, right? If I don't find business. So I decided to borrow the money and I'm very lucky, it's cash interest free. And because I have cash, I told I need to do the next thing. I went to tell, if you go to my Facebook, you sell the speech I did. I went to tell all my staff in Singapore and Hong Kong, please stay together. We can overcome this crisis if we all work together. But you all must stay together. I promise you, I will not cut your salary. Neither will I uh, retrench you, make you redundant. Because I believe that without the people, I can't run my business. And I told them one thing that we are here as a social enterprise. And our job is very important. You see, we are help, help me to help the poor and the needy. So what we did in, in Singapore is that at this very moment, instead of elderly coming here, COVID-19 shut down the whole business. So what I did is we do food delivery because people still need to work. I need to eat. So what I did is I went out and I go to the nursing home. I tell them, don't stop. We'll cook for you. So in Singapore, every day we generate over 600 to 1,000 boxes of meal to serve the elderly. And we are very fortunate. We get sponsors, right? People come in and say, okay, Mr. Cole, while you're doing this, why don't we pay for the book, food? And we got sponsors. We supply to the hospital. We supply to prisoners and so forth, right? That's very important. Communicate with your staff. I went back to Hong Kong at that time and I told my Hong Kong staff, stay with me and we will go through this. We can help the people in Hong Kong. So I told them, okay, so in Hong Kong now, at this very moment, at this very moment, they are delivering 300 packets of mailbox to the homeless people in Agao Street uh, in Mong Kong, or Kaolong area. And the queue started with just 30 boxes. Now the queue is over 300 boxes. The COVID-19 has generated a lot of unemployment and some of them are quite sad. So basically, we communicate with all the people to stay together. So 
what I'm trying to explain, success and failure depend a lot on you, right? Success is a satisfying state of mind. Failure is when you stop trying. And I told my son, stop, we have not stopped. We are not failed yet. We can still try. And I'm very proud of my staff. So in, as of today, uh, there are 70 people working in Singapore for me, of which 59 of them, 58 of them are people with disability. In Hong Kong, I have 58 people working there now, of which 49 of them are disabled, right? So in total, I have something like 128 people working for me. Before the crisis, I, I, I treat elderly to lunch every day, 40, 40, 40 every day. As of today, as of January this year, I've done over 130,000 mailbox for them. As of Singapore, at, as of this moment, I've done thousands of mailbox, right, every week. So what I'm trying to explain to you is that we haven't failed yet and we are just trying. And I'm very blessed that, just to give you an idea, at least the last six months, we haven't lost. Okay, we lost a bit, but I think that little bit is not too bad and we survived. So I hope you enjoyed the sharing. Right. Any question? Let me get back my picture just now when I lost you guys. I don't know where you are now. Hi, Ko. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for this incredibly inspiring masterclass. Um, can I ask everyone to try and... So if Sorry, Ko, first, if you can um, quit your presentation, then everyone will be quit? coming back up um, okay. in the okay. tiled... Okay. There we yeah. go. Please, uh, ask, please ask question because we, I we, actually we, went to a lot of it right yeah we, and we've, very we've, got loads of, we've got loads of questions code can i ask everyone to try and turn your camera on and see how the um connection will fare so that co can see you thank you so much um so i'm just gonna dive straight into it um ronak can you um ask your question about uh, prioritizing money over social good please yeah sure um hi mr song can you hear me hi Tama. yeah i can hear you uh, cool. Uh, firstly, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, I mean, I've seen you've been through quite a lot of different phases, so that was exciting to hear. Uh, my question is more about, um, so, you know, in today's world, people value money more than social good. So how do you plan to inspire people uh, about social entrep in entrepreneurship and how will you inspire the young generation about focusing more on helping the community rather than running after materialistic things like money or something like that okay uh let me answer the question in chinese there's two words ting her tian ting is relationship tian is money it's a fine balance so for example i can't very simple example let's say for example every batch i take a student of eight or nine student trainees to come in if my look my fund is low i take four i don't take say eight you know what i mean I plan ahead. I actually plan ahead. So, for example, elderly coming for lunch. If my money, if the sales I generated, I told you I got different revenue, right? If my sales for the next one month, two months is not so good, I don't take 40. I take 30. Sometimes I take 20, you know? So, there is always a fine balance. And I'm very fortunate. I built a team of people now that help me to balance off. You cannot forsake the reason why you do this. If you do, if you look at money all the time, don't do it. You can never succeed. So there's always a fine balance that you are in it to help out. But let me explain one thing to you. So I realized that I can't save the world. So there are people who come and say, you know, the mental patient who go funny, you know, some of them, you must realize you cannot help. So walk away because you can't save the world. So I learned a long time ago, if I really cannot help you, I don't do it. Maybe you can, that somebody else will help you. So always remember, though you want to do social good, you must always remember, can you really help the person? So we are very fortunate. Let me tell you something. Over the years, our success rate huh, for finding and training them is 100%. We can definitely get you a job. But to be able to stay on the job after one year, in Singapore, the benchmark is 5%. In Hong Kong, 35%. In my dignity kitchen is 60%. You know why? You have to keep them. You cannot just place them job and you walk away. You go back and see, okay, it's called a one, two, four, eight. Week one, week two, week four, week eight. You must check on them. By the way, if they can last, they can last eight, week eight, huh? oh, very good. You're very happy. So you see, 
your focus cannot be always money. They were time that I really got no money. Do you know where the money come from? When I first started with the first shop you saw there, I remortgaged my office. And that bring in 200,000 Singapore dollars to fund the whole tree. And I tell you, first two years, uh, I lost a thousand dollar by by tree. I lost 300, 300 pounds per day. Can you imagine? I keep losing money. You know, my wife was screaming at his heart, my mother in law, father, everybody, you must, you must stop. But you see, I know if I develop all the five revenue, you know, my training, my event, then I think I'm out of the, you know, you must be very focused that I can do it. So I really have to find my focus. If I tell everybody I need to get the event up, I need to invite people, to, I need to go, nobody will believe you. So you got to do it. So by then, the uh, first two years, I lost a thousand dollars, Singapore dollar a day. Over the first two years, I lost nearly 277. I bought about 300,000 pounds just to try this baby up. But saying that, I'm okay now. So coming to back your shaman is always balanced. If you cannot do 40 elderly, do 20, right? But still do it, right? And then money, honestly, you have to work for it. It doesn't drop from the sky. So you got to be very innovative. There's a lot of ways we make money, but uh, so far so good. And we are very lucky. Over 10 years, we've got Merrill Lynch, Deutsche Bank, Fanel, everybody, BHP, all supporting us. You know why? CSR is the biggest thing now in the market, correct? Corporate social responsibility. Do you know that every listed company in the world has to do CSR, correct? So sell them the CSR. But they know they can do to us because we are professional. We are ISO 22000. We are the approved training organization, only hawker training program in Asia, right? And I'm the winner of the President Challenge Award, which means your business is sustainable. So you see, you need to get the branding. It's called brand management. And the rest is easy. But let me give you a tip of advice. Always build the team first. Everything starts with the team. Find the people. And that is the secret. So the guys, you all these girls and boys sitting next to you are your potential partner. Remember? Who knows? I don't know. Uh, maybe Charlotte in, Charlotte's father is a multi multi-billionaire, you know? Right, you never know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so you see, always befriend everybody. You never know who will be your partner. Right. Maybe I don't know. One of you are very good at sales. One of you are, I don't know. Fiona is good at sales. Uh, Laura is good at marketing, you know. Find that strength and build the team first. Don't start with money. Money is not your critical part. Without the team, you got no business. I think I answered your question, did I? Quite long. Yeah. Right? No, thank you. Okay, so next much. question. <laughs> Uh, Thank you, Co. Um, Catherine uh, Mordlock, are you? I think you're still here, aren't you? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Hi. Would you I like to ask your question, been. please, about overcoming difficulties? Yeah, of course. Um, so my question was: When setting up Project Dignity, how did you overcome any rejection that you got, say, from funding or any criticism um, that it wouldn't be successful or wouldn't work out? Okay. Before I answer the question, let me explain to you what is stress. I don't know how many of you are engineers. Now remember, stress, you remember the sign stress, sigma, is equal to force divided by area, correct? Okay, I'm an engineer, so I've explained to you engineering firm. So stress is force divided by area. Identify the force. Let me tell you something. If something happened to your mommy, daddy, something happened to your girl, no, maybe not girlfriend or boyfriend, but mommy, daddy, you'll be stressed, correct? So identify the thing that can stress you. By the way, study doesn't stress you. It just makes you, you know, right. Divide by area. So always share your problem. Tell your problem to everybody. So you see, I have stress. So if the denominator is, sorry, the numerator is small, the denominator is high, you get very little stress. Now, coming back to your question, do I get stressed when I got problem? The answer is no. Because only something happened to my children, my wife, my mommy, daddy, I will be worried. But if something happened to my business or somebody rejected me, I always tell myself, someday you'll come to see me. You understand? Because sooner or later, you're going to get in trouble or get some problem. For example, if it happened to give birth to a child is autistic, you, it just happened. I got rejected by somebody who feel that nobody would do this. 
And for months and weeks, I've been asking him to sponsor me. Eventually, he said no. Six years down the road, he came to see me. He got a stroke. So I told myself, somehow life is such that if your heart is pure and you're trying to help somebody, right, something good will come about. You understand? So don't feel bad about rejection. You know, like if your boyfriend dumb you or the girlfriend dumb you, there's always some, there's always another day. That's how I see it. I get rejected many times. I get played out many times. I get cheated many times. Because people you abuse the word social enterprise. Some people use it because they want to tap government money. You know, when you do a social enterprise, government will give you some startup money. I was started at the wrong time. At that time, nobody gave us money. But if in Singapore, if you start a social enterprise, government will give you 30,000, 40,000 pounds. Right. So a lot of people want to abuse the system. Right. So very simple. I have a recent case now. You see, I'm located in four hospitals, correct? Now, hospitals don't sell lottery. They cannot, they're not allowed to sell lottery. But the Singapore biggest lottery organization wants to buy into me and so that they can open lottery shop inside the hospital. Unfortunately, I don't buy it. So I didn't do it. So a lot of time, you have to balance your value. You must, by the way, Catherine, you must have a value because you know why? The value is what kept you going. And my value is honesty and integrity. My reputation is everywhere. Remember this guy, you are good as your reputation, right? So if you maintain a good reputation, people will come and see you. And don't worry if you get rejected. That is part and parcel of this business. And there is always another day. That's all. Does that answer the question? Still positive. Yeah, Be perfect. Positive. Thank you. This is part and parcel. Right. Doesn't make sense to you, but it took me all through this obstacle because you know why? Training normal people is tough. Training disabled people is tougher. So what do I have? I have something called expectation and deliverable. If you don't have expectation, you get zero disappointment, correct? If you expect them to be here and they deliver here, you get disappointment. If you expect them here and they did here, come on, you go for, let's say for example, your O level, you expect a a B, and you get an A, wow, you feel happy. So for me, is that I got no expectation of any disability. And so I don't get disappointed. Right, there's okay, some, some life advice for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they don't apply to you, but apply to me because we work with people with disability. It's different. <laughs> no, seriously, honestly, when you work with people with disability, you expect them to do certain things. But if they don't do it, you get disappointed. So the best is no disappointment, no dis expectation. I hope you enjoyed the talk so far. Okay, um, next. Yeah, yeah, we've got a few more questions coming. So, um, Shahab, can you uh, can you ask your question, please? Yes, thank you for your presentation. Hi, Shahab. Hi. Uh, my question was, what are the biggest challenges in financially sustaining a social enterprise? You did. Uh, talk about some points, but if you could expand on those, thank you. The biggest challenge for financial is that yes, okay. Financially, go into three sector. It covers the working capital. That means every day I pay for my staff, my salary, everything. Right. The second uh, financial goes into development. A lot of time we develop new ideas, new project, new this thing. So that may not be funded at all. The third one goes into my pocket. I mean, I go into business, I must at least make some money for myself, right? So the first question is uh, my working capital, my operation, my operating cost. That one is very challenging, right? But after a few, after a while, your that that part of it balances off because every day you sell food, every day you, do, you make that effort, right? The second part of it is actually coming out new ideas. You see, Social enterprise is about innovation. So I put a lot of money into innovation to decide how to do a one-hand machine for noodle blending. I also create a machine for making clay pot rice individually. If you go to our website, you see all these gadgets. I spend a lot of money on coming out new ideas and all that. Because if I were to go to government for fun to do this, it's going to waste a lot of time. I got the right business plan. So I decide, forget about it. I go and try myself. The third one is I must make some money for myself and support my family. Right, financially. The first three years, I was losing a lot of money. I actually lost my property. Where did the money come from? 
The first one I started cost me 200,000 for the remortgage of my office. The second one, when I moved to 14,000, I borrowed half a million dollars, which I've been paying. Let me tell the reality of business. When I come to the third one, which is where I am now, all these are your friends. Let me tell the reality of business. When you lose money, you don't have friends. I really lost all my friends. Why? They know, first of all, you're going to borrow money. And you're going to borrow money to go into a social enterprise which is not making money. So practically no friend at all. My mom passed away. So on that day, my mom passed away. She left me some money. I told my mom, mom, I'm going to do it. So I took the money. I went to the, where I am today. So the project cost nearly one million Singapore dollars. I think my mom would be very happy that I carry on. Right? So if you ever come to Dignity Kitchen, there's a room called Mother's Room and there's a room called Father's Room, dedicated to my mom and dad. Right? Because I think the only person who actually support me all these years, not even my wife, not even my children, is my mother. My mother really think that. Uh, my mother was the one who said, can you stop talking about your idea? Let's go and do it. And that was the impetus behind going there. So the person that actually be good to your mom and dad, by the way, they have money. <laughs> and they supported me. I'm very, I'm very pleased. My mom didn't get a chance to see the end result. But I'm very pleased I did it. Understand? So the financial part of it, now at least I've got decent salary after what, six years, seven years? I got my I pay my full salary. It's still it's only one fifth of what I earn before I do this. But at least it, it kept me going. But don't forget, I own 100 percent of dignity, project dignity. I also own 100 percent of project dignity Hong Kong. If you ask me how much I value dignity kitchen, priceless. Right. Wait till I finish the whole thing, it's worth a lot more. I haven't finished yet. Okay, I hope uh Shuma, I hope I answer your question. Yes. Always remember, come to the financial side. Be sure to cover yourself. Come on, you're not going to support if you don't have money, proper money earning for yourself. Then your social enterprise is a failure. Make sure you have salary for yourself. But to be fair, it took me six years, five years before I reached a stage, right? So be patient. So the financial strength on you, the last one is the most important. Please pay yourself. I hope I answered the question proper. Yes, thank you very much for that. That's lovely. Thank you, Ko. Um, Sumya, can I invite you to answer your question, please? So, near where is you? Yeah, okay. I'm here. Um, my question was, do you have any advice for recent graduates who want to build a startup from scratch? Thank you. Five items. First, find something you love to do. If you love music, if you love the dancing, find a passion. So it's a heart. The second one, plus. The second one, uh, time. Remember this, uh, there's only 24 hours in a day. Uh, maybe six hours you go and brush your teeth, everything, whatever you do. Uh, eight hours you go to work. You know, there's physical time, family time, you know, there's spiritual time. Time is fixed. So if you want to do something, invest time in it. Don't expect people to earn money. You. The third one is knowledge, is a book. Uh, never stop learning. If you think I know about hot food business, I know nuts about food business. I only know how to eat. But now I'm an expert in designing a food court. But it, I learned along the way, never stop learning. The fourth item is money, right? Money is not how much you have, it's how you spend it. So if you look at mine, I started very small. I started with only... Uh, let me get a pen on it. I started with only uh, a very small one. Okay. So first I draw for you first. First is heart. Second one is time. Third one is knowledge. Fourth one is money. And the fifth item is health. Good health. Because in any business, physically, mentally, you must be fit. That's what Sham was saying. Mentally, you must be very fit. And all this encompass opportunity. I don't know whether you can see what I just draw. Okay. So if you see this one, are you there? Okay. Passion for what you do. Invest time in the business. Right. There's no way you can say, okay, I work. So if time can be borrowed, that means if three of you together, that is more than 24 hours already. The third one is more important is knowledge. Never stop learning. 
you keep asking yourself can you see that thing knowledge the next one is money so budget yourself do you know that i don't have a business plan since i started and don't forget i'm a senior manager of coopers and pwc and i don't even develop a business plan i only have a cash flow plan meaning that how much i have all the time the next one is health physical health and mental health right because physically by the way business will strain you a lot so stay healthy and mentally you must be very strong because there are a lot of naysayers people will tell your idea it's a stupid idea whatever don't listen to them listen to your heart and finally the window of opportunity right and that's what makes it so special so coming back to your question find that passion find that something you love to do and you'll be surprised i love food and by the way i put on a lot of weight but i love food and food is my passion i bet you guys also love food right so i'm i'm quite i don't know how to cook by the way but i know how to eat and i know i know how to be critical <laughs> and that's why i'm the boss so find that passion invest time in the idea never stop learning budget yourself how much you have to start a business and finally more importantly is good health and all these are opportunity by the way opportunities everywhere is either you want to take it or you create it that's all and i tell you sheffield now is encouraging a lot of young people like you to start up so don't don't waste that opportunity okay any more questions where are you guys from by the way are you from all from sheffield or england or what are they all from different part of the world where are you from shama where are you from me oh i'm where from are you guys sheffield. where sheffield as in like i went oh. to uni in sheffield yes okay anybody out of this world out of the country or something like that? Anybody else, any foreigners? Any for I was a foreign student, by the way. So um, are you all from? Um, no, I'm I'm from South Africa, but originally from Zimbabwe. But I'm in Sheffield okay. at the moment. Yeah. Okay. What about anybody else? Uh, I'm from China, and I'm a Tibetan. <laughs> where, where, where? Oh, uh, okay. Qinghai era, China. Yeah. Oh, nice place. I've been there. Right. So you see, whatever you see today can be replicated across anywhere in the world why every country has disabled people i can go to south africa now find a six thousand square feet area build a school build my training center and i get disabled people to cook right and i get poor people to come and eat then i went to see i'll get to see porter and gamble unilever to supply the food that's all right and it's actually self-sustaining get it from the rich and give it to the poor but you need a vehicle to do this. And food court is a vehicle. Question. Fantastic. I, th I think um, so I think we've, we've uh, reached the end of the masterclass. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Well, I, I definitely enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm sure everybody else did as well. Yeah, I see everybody nodding. <laughs>